Hello, good evening. Welcome to Skeptics in the Pub Online. My name is Gerald, and I'm happy to see so many of you online today. Um, I, normally, I live in Cologne, Germany, where I'm co part of one of the local teams running Skeptics in the Pub. And there has been a rumor that I want to talk about that I'm spending too much time playing with dinosaur toys. I own no toys, so I'm not playing with them. Thanks. That's all I wanted to say about this. Okay, in case you have not encountered us before, let me introduce you to Skeptics in a Pub. We used to meet in various pubs around the UK and further out to listen to talks about science, rationalism, and good thinking. But this is the age of COVID-19. So we put our heads together and started these online talks, which I'm happy to say quickly grew into a lovely community with our own Discord server and various channels on social media. If you want more details and want to join us, watch out for our chat moderators providing the link repeatedly throughout the evening. The moderators will also provide the links for either buying some of our merchandise or let you know how to donate some money if you think what we do is worth supporting. As always, tonight's event will be following the usual recipe. We will have to talk. It will be about 30 to 45 minutes. It will be followed by a 15 minute break for refreshments or comfort breaks. And we will close the evening out with a Q&A with our speaker. If you want to ask a question for the Q&A, please go to the following link, sitp.online forward slash ask, where you will be able to ask or upvote questions. You do not need an account on that site, but if you want to add a name or even your name in the optional field, that at least will let us know who asked the question when we read it out. Now about tonight's speaker and subject matter. If you have read our ads and announcements, you will know that tonight's title is The Century of Deception, the Birth of the Hoax in 18th Century England. Or to put it in a more contemporary way for the social media generation, 10 April's Fool Jokes That Went Horribly Wrong, number seven will leave you utterly shocked. <laughs> we are thrilled to welcome Ian Keeble to talk to us about this subject tonight. Ian has got a first class degree from the University of Oxford in philosophy, politics and economics. He qualified as a chartered accountant and then became a professional magician. He's a member of the Magic Circle with Gold Star. He has won several awards for his unique brand of comedy magic. He's also performed on television and he's written and presented programs for BBC Radio. He is an accredited lecturer for the Arts Society and he gives talks on magic history, cartoons and 18th century hoaxes. Besides The Century of Deception, the book about tonight's subject, he has also published books with titles such as Stand Up, A Professional Guide to Comedy Magic, and Charles Dickens' Magician, Conjuring in Life, Letters and Literature. So, let's get started. Please put your hands together in the chat for Ian Keeble. Thank you very much indeed, Gerald, for that uh, wonderful introduction there. And thank you all very much for those of you who are uh, seeing this live and for those of you who aren't seeing it live uh, good to see you too so as was mentioned in the introduction i am a professional magician uh, as well as uh, a writer and speaker and i think it was being a professional magician which brought me towards the subject of hoaxes in the first place uh, this is me in performance mode so to speak and just to show you how hilariously funny i am uh, this is me working with uh, Gok Wan quite a few years ago. As you can see, we're both having a whirl of a time there. So I was attracted to the idea of hoaxes because I do feel they have the same attributes as a good comedy magic trick in the sense that a good hoax should both be funny um, and also fooling the same way that a magic trick is as well. So I think that was why um, the idea and... Uh, the concept of hoaxes uh, was of interest to me. In defining a hoax, I, I think most people appreciate what a hoax is without going into a sort of dictionary definition of it. I have a couple of sort of um, negative definitions of hoaxes, if you like. Uh, the first one is that a hoax is not a financial scam or con. Um, of the 10 hoaxes which I look in my book, uh, look at in my book relating to the 18th century, only one of them has a financial motive. All the others have other motives, uh, which I'll be discussing a little bit during the course of this talk. Having said they're not, uh, there's no financial motives, there is actually one which did have a financial motive. And ironically, it's the one hoax that didn't actually manage to realise any money at the end of it. 
so I think that's a, an important point to make under my definition. As I say, it's not a financial con or a scam, uh, nor is it a conspiracy theory. Um, I do believe that uh, a conspiracy theory can start off as a hoax. Uh, for instance, uh, the crop circle, it's quite possible that the first crop circle was put together by some drunken agricultural students for a, a good prank. And but then it was sort of taken up by other people and converted into the possibility that aliens perhaps came down and made these crop circles. So but once it develops into a, a, a conspiracy theory, under my definition, it is no longer a hoax. So I think by definition, also a hoax, essentially 90, at least 99.9 percent .9 of people when it is exposed must realize that it is a hoax. You can never account for, uh, you know, the 0.1 percent of people around. Uh, the final thing to say is that a hoax can be for a short period or can be for a very long period. Um, this is perhaps one of the most famous hoaxes of this country, which is the Panorama hoax that took place in 1957 when Richard Dimbleby, the presenter of Panorama at the time on April the 1st, uh, persuaded the British public to believe that spaghetti was being harvested. And I think a lot of people fell for it at the time when pasta dishes was not quite so well known in this country. Um, but that was a hoax which was essentially exposed the following day. Uh, by uh, the next day, I think um, nearly everybody would have realised that it was a hoax. Um, by contrast, we have a paleoanthropology say that again, a paleoanthropological hoax, uh, which is Piltdown Man, which was where a man called Charles Dawson uh, supposedly discovered the link between man and ape. And that actually took 40 years before it was exposed. So, as I say, hoaxes can last a short time or a long time. OK, so having um, hopefully defined what I mean by a hoax, we move now on to the 18th century. And why am I saying that the 18th century was the birth of hoaxes? Now, clearly there were hoaxes prior to the 18th century. I mean, for instance, April Fool's Day, we know goes right back to the 16th century. But what I mean by that is essentially it's only really from 1700 onwards that the information about the hoax is, is really out there and there is a huge amount of information. Prior to that, there is often very little. Uh, this is one of the hoaxes I talk about in my book, uh, possibly the most famous hoax of the 18th century, which is the one of Mary Toft, who claimed that she was giving birth to rabbits. Uh, this little image actually comes from an engraving by William Hogarth called Credulity, uh, Fanaticism and Superstition. And in it, he depicts a number of hoaxes, including, as we can see, Mary Toft. There she is. And emerging from underneath her are the rabbits. I would point out that when Mary Toff produced the rabbits, they weren't actually live rabbits. Uh, they came out in, in bits of rabbits. But nevertheless, uh, she did allegedly give birth to no less than 17 rabbits. Now, all this took place in 1726, and there was a huge amount of information about this hoax, which we can still read about today, obviously. By contrast, we also have in this particular image, uh, this gentleman here, who was called, uh, well, it was known as the Bilson Boy hoax. And essentially he claimed that he'd been bewitched into vomiting up uh, nails and pins and many little shoehorns, as we can see in the engraving. But the information about this hoax only comes from a couple of pamphlets. So we're not, although we've got um, some detail about the hoax, we really haven't got the full background detail. So, as I say, it's really only from 1700 onwards that we have huge amount of information about individual hoaxes, and that enables us to really go into them in, in great detail. So where does this information come from? Well, it comes from a number of sources. The first and primary one, I guess, is newspapers and journals. There was an exponential growth in newspapers from 1700 onwards, but also in uh, in England uh, and indeed Scotland, the rest of the Union, uh, there was also a huge number of journals. The Gentleman's Magazine, which you can see up there, is probably the most famous, but there were plenty of other journals like the London Magazine. But there was also a myriad of uh, newspapers, all of which 
for instance, reported extensively on the Mary Toft case. So you would have the sort of daily report, but also have the monthly report at the end when the journal was produced at the end of each month. Another huge source in the 18th century was pamphlets. Pamphlets were produced on a regular basis. They tended either to be satirical, and it must be said that some of the humour of these satirical pamphlets are rather lost on uh, modern day audiences, uh, or polemical, um, arguing a point of view. And for the Mary Toff case, there were at least 20 pamphlets produced all about uh, the Mary Toft case. Um, a third source, and a really important one, and one that particularly fascinates me, is satirical prints. Uh, satirical prints were basically standalone engravings that were produced by the likes of William Hogarth and later in the 18th century, people like uh, James Gilray and Thomas Rowlandson. These are not part of newspapers or journals because they didn't have the technology to produce both at the same time. So you would actually buy these from print shops. But in many respects, a lot of them are rather like your main cartoon in your political, uh, your political cartoon in your broadsheet or tabloid newspaper, because they're very topical and they relate to events that took place. And of the 10 hoaxes I look in the book, I think seven of them had uh, quite a few satirical cartoons relating to those individual hoaxes. And by looking at these, you can really see what, what people were thinking at the time, what their sort of biasness was, uh, probably even better than you can by reading newspapers and pamphlets. Uh, a fourth source, which again turns up with Mary Toft, is the recreation of a hoax on stage. This often happened in the 18th century. They used to have what they, they called afterpieces in um, Georgian theatre. So you'd have your main theatrical event, which is often a Shakespearean play. And then you would have what they used to call an afterpiece, which is a bit like a sort of a farce or a pantomime. And it would often incorporate topical events into it. Often there was a harlequin involved, as we can see in this reproduction here. And it's very similar, therefore, to pantomime today, where we would just sort of incorporate jokes about Brexit and COVID into our pantomimes. They did exactly the same thing in the 18th century. And quite a few of the hoaxes were so well known that they were incorporated into uh, these afterpieces. So Mary Toft certainly was, and apparently there were sort of howls of laughter when sort of rabbits were scattering all over the stage to represent Mary Toft. And the final one, which occurs in a couple of hoaxes, which I look at, which is a court transcripts. Um, Old Bailey court transcripts came into being in the 17th century and were very prevalent throughout the 18th century. And a couple of the hoaxes I look at in the book went to trial. And so we have extensive information again uh, from this source. So. Basically, what I'm saying is we have a huge amount of information about individual hoaxes. Uh, one thing we cannot complain about is having insufficient information, which enables us to go into the hoaxes, as I say, in, in very great detail. I was, when writing this book, I was particularly interested in a couple of aspects, which I hope would interest you as well. Uh, the two key questions for me when looking at hoaxes was, first of all, the motivation of the hoaxer. Why did the hoaxer carry out the hoax? And the second one is, how did they pull it off? And actually, the second is often um, not as simple as it, as it sounds. What, what I mean is, how did they pull it off? We know how they did the hoax, but why did people fall for it? And often it's uh, quite a bit more complicated than it might seem uh, on the surface. To be honest, of, of the 10 hoaxes I look at, um, I think number two can basically be answered in all 10 of them. We do know absolutely because of the surfeit of information about the hoax, how they managed to get away with it, how they managed to fool people with it. The motivation of the hoax is often a lot more complex, uh, as we will discover. So what I want to do is to look at um, three or four hoaxes, um, go into a little bit more detail about them and look particularly at these two aspects. Of course, in doing that, I will have to explain a little bit about the hoax as well. So the first hoax I'm going to look at is one of the earliest one. It took place in 1708. And in this, I think we do clearly know both the motivation of the hoaxer and also how he pulled it off. And the gentleman concerned is somebody who you will all be familiar with, 
This is Jonathan Swift. Jonathan Swift, of course, best known for writing Gulliver's Travels. And this is quite a long way before he wrote Gulliver's Travels. So this is uh, relatively early on in his career when he was a clergyman in Ireland at the time. And he got into battle with an astrologer by the name of John Partridge. And John Partridge was a very successful astrologer, mainly through writing his almanacs, which were called Melinus Liberatus. This is an example of one of his almanacs. Almanacs were huge in the 16th, 17th and into the 18th century as well. I suspect most of us are familiar with almanacs. They're even around today. Old oh, Moore's almanac is still going strong uh, in 2022, as you can see. It's already making predictions for that year. Um, but back in the in the 18th century, in the 17th century, they were much more popular. Uh, John Partridge, at the height of his his powers as an astrologer, was selling 20,000 almanacs, a, a huge number. But apart from making the sort of common predictions, which you might expect to do with, you know, what the weather was going to be like, personal ones relating to sort of childbirth, uh, what the harvest that everybody was concerned about that. He was also using it as political propaganda. And this is where he fell out with Jonathan Swift, because Jonathan Swift and John Partridge were polar opposites when it came to their politics. John Partridge was essentially a man who was in favour of pursuing the war of Spanish succession, which was going on in 1708. He was also sort of instinctively anti-royalist, um, anti the Stuarts, uh, very much in favour of the Georgians when they eventually came to power. Jonathan Swift, on the other hand, was a, a high Tory, sort of Catholic orientated, but also very much against the war of Spanish succession. So they clash very much politically. And John Parcher was basically slipping into his almanac's propaganda to uh, promote his own cause, which really uh, annoyed Jonathan Swift. Plus, of course, he realised that uh, almanacs were a complete load of nonsense, that somehow basing predictions on, on comets and uh, the false fact that somehow the Earth was the centre of the universe uh, was complete rubbish. Um, but um, obviously a lot of people believed in it. So the question was, was how was Jonathan Swift going to hoax John Partridge? And his solution, I think, is, is absolute genius. But in order to appreciate it, I think you have to sort of think to amongst yourselves, how do you get back as an astrologer? How do you demonstrate predictions by almanacs? In, in today's age, it tends to be mediums, tarot card readers, horoscopes, whatever, are nonsense. Well, essentially, there are two ways. The first way is show their predictions don't come true. But the problem with this is that this is very hard to do because people like John Partridge were as good at uh, coming up with double speak as today's mediums and tarot card readers are. So a couple of examples, John Partridge would often make predictions with a question mark. So he might say something like a, a lawyer will be appointed to a high office question mark. Which means, of course, that if it doesn't come true, he said, well, he was only making uh, a question mark about it. He wasn't actually making a definite prediction. He would also say something like um, good news from France, but not all may be of that opinion. Well, again, he has it both ways. Uh, you might think it's good news, but on the other hand, you might not. Um, so all his predictions are very sort of woolly. Um, he also has the sort of ultimate get out clause. Uh, well, he has two ultimate get out clauses. One of them is the statement that the stars incline, they don't compel. So once again, he's only suggesting that the stars are making this prediction, but they not might not necessarily come true. And the final one is always the resort to God, because God in his infinite wisdom determined that after all, he wouldn't make the prediction come true. So John Parcher is an absolute master of this type of double speak prediction. Just to give a, a, a one of uh, his most famous example, in 1688, he predicted the death of a great king. Now, in 1688, if you know your history, this was the glorious revolution when James II was forced to abdicate because um, William and Mary came over and took over uh, and he fled to France. And John Partridge claimed this as a success. He said, 
the death of a great king. Well, it was pointed out that James II didn't die. He just um, abdicated. And John Partridge's response was, well, what actually happened was a civil death. And a civil death is worse than an actual death. And that was the way he got around that particular one. So as you can see, very Weasley trying to show astrologers that their predictions haven't come true is not really a way of getting at them. The second way you could argue is to satirize or mock them. And of course, this is often done. Uh, and in fact, it was done with John Partridge, a man called Tom Brown in 1708, the same year that uh, Jonathan Swift played his hoax. Uh, he produced, uh, Tom Brown produced an almanac and he, it was supposedly by a man called Sylvester Partridge. So he was uh, picking up on another well-known astrologer of that period. And in that, uh, he was making sort of ridiculous comments like uh, if predictions, he would say, if rainy, there will be few street walkers in Cheapside and Fleet Street. So it was sort of amusing. Um, but the problem was that it almost certainly didn't sell that many copies, because at the end of the day, as we all know, unfortunately, um, those people who promote um, such matters as uh, uh, tarot card reading or psychic abilities always outsell those who attempt to debunk it. It's just a, a sad fact. I'm afraid that skeptics in the pub is built on a very poor financial model. <laughs> it would probably get uh, many more people uh, participating if you were actually going around promoting psychic abilities rather than debunking it. So that's just a, a sad fact of life. And that was true back in the 18th century. So although the Sylvester Partridge book did sell, uh, John Partridge's uh, almanac was uh, totally outselling it in terms of numbers. So what was Jonathan Swift's solution? Well, as I say, absolute genius as far as I'm concerned. What he did, he produced his own almanac. Uh, this was written, as you can see, by Isaac Bickerstaff, which was basically uh, a pseudonym for Jonathan Swift. Uh, it was a predictions for the year 1708. It actually came out at the beginning of February 1708, which is unusual for almanacs because almanacs would usually came out, you know, two or three months before the beginning of the year. But what he did in this almanac is he made a number of predictions. And his first prediction, which he called butter trifle, was to predict on the 29th of March 1708 the death of John Partridge because of a fever. Now, the great genius of this particular comment was that it was a very specific prediction. And as we've seen, astrologers never made specific predictions. So this completely caught out John Partridge because basically he was saying, 29th of February, 1708, you, John Partridge, will die. And this is my prediction, which I've made. I'm using a, a new type of uh, predicting events uh, based uh, loosely on the comets. Um, he sort of says in his introduction that other people had uh, told him how well it worked and his other predictions had all come true. But this was his specific prediction. And John Partridge was flummoxed by this uh, and how to respond to this. So this happened on the beginning of February uh, 1708, around about the 30th of March. So the day after John Partridge uh, supposedly passed away, a letter came out written by a civil servant, again, penned by Jonathan Swift, which essentially said that uh, he had been present at the deathbed of none other than John Partridge. So he'd witnessed his demise on the 29th of March. Amusingly, he said uh, that Isaac Bickerstaff's prediction was out by a few hours. Uh, he hadn't got the exact hour, but he got pretty close to it. At the same time, Jonathan Swift also produced an epitaph as well. And I just got to quote a couple of lines from it, uh, just to give you a background on that. Apart from being an astrologer, uh, John Partridge in his early life was a cobbler. And also he was a quack doctor. He used to sort of sell these uh, quack medicine, which he would advertise in his almanacs again. So thereby making even more money. Uh, quack doctor, very common in the 18th century, but mainly selling uh, medicine against uh, against venereal diseases. But um, Jonathan Swift wrote this epitaph about uh, John Partridge. And just to quote a couple of lines um, here, five foot feet deep lies on his back 
a star monger, astrologer, and quack. Weep all you customers who use his pills, his almanacs, or shoes. So a brilliantly sort of witty uh, riposte to John Partridge. Now, how was John Partridge going to respond to this? Well, really, he could only respond the following year. So in 1709, he produced his own almanac. And in it, he basically said, um, I'm not dead. <laughs> and I wasn't dead on the 29th of March. So that was his response. Uh, but this was sort of meat and drink to Jonathan Swift because he immediately came back with another document, again, by Isaac Bickerstaff, saying, well, uh, John Partridge claims he's not dead, but anybody who writes the nonsense which he writes can't possibly be alive. Also, he's making predictions, which means he has to consort with the devil, which means, of course, again, he must be dead. And finally, he noted, as was often true, even though people died, their almanac carried on. Old Maud's Almanac being a classic example. And ironically, it also happened to John Partridge when he died, uh, which happened in 1715. Uh, he was still <laughs> producing Almanacs right through to the 1720s. Uh, so Jonathan Swift made that point that even if he claims to be alive, this has almost certainly been written by somebody else. So that was his sort of final riposte to uh, to John Partridge. So it was as a wonderful hoax. I think he 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 drew uh, John Partridge in. John Partridge had no idea who Isaac Bickerstaff was. It would appear from some of his letters that he believed that he was some sort of genuine astrologer. I'm not sure if he even knew that he'd been hoaxed. Later on, he discovered it was Jonathan Swift, but at the time he didn't. And the other thing it did, um, this predictions for the year 1708 sold a huge number of copies. Um, Jonathan Swift actually complained at one point that people were ripping it off and, and selling it at half price. And I think it almost definitely contributed to almanacs no longer making sort of political propaganda in their predictions. Prior to this period, quite a lot of important kings and princes and noblemen actually did rely to a certain extent on almanacs. But I think after this attack by Jonathan Swift, sending up the whole idea of almanacs, uh, the sort of political uh, predictions uh, started to fade away and most people really didn't respond to them. Of course, it didn't get rid of almanacs altogether, but it did make a, a huge contribution, I think, to the history of almanacs generally. So an absolutely brilliant uh, prediction by, uh, sorry, a brilliant hoax by Jonathan Swift. We know uh, as I say, why he did it to get his to get back at John Partridge, and we know how he did it, as as uh, hopefully I've outlined. Um, moving on to another prediction, another hoax. Sorry, this is one by a man called George Sarmanazar, and I think what's fascinating about this hoax is how he managed to get away with it. Um, George Sarmanazar was actually a Frenchman by birth. Uh, he was born in the sort of late uh, 17th century. Uh, he had a very good education. He spoke fluent Latin and Greek from an early age. Uh, I won't go through his early life, but eventually uh, he sort of left home and he joined the Dutch army. And while he was in the Dutch army, he pretended that he came from Japan. He told everybody he was Japanese. He made up a Japanese language. He behaved how he felt uh, the Japanese would behave. Eventually, uh, with this regiment, he was barracked with a Scottish regiment with a chaplain there, a man called the Reverend Alexander Innes. And Alexander Innes, who was a bit of a crook himself, instantly recognised that George Sarmanazar was not from Japan. But together, they sort of concocted a plan together whereby Innes would pretend that he converted George from his heathen Eastern religion to the Anglican faith. But they felt that Japan was a little bit too well known. So they opted instead for Taiwan, which back in the 18th century was known as Formosa. So from then on, George was known as the Formosan, well, in later life, the Formosan imposter. And they, again, convinced everybody that George was generally from Formosa uh, to convince people even more, apart from worshipping a sort of sun god, which he did each evening. Uh, he also resorted to eating raw meat to demonstrate just how even he was. Anyway, Alexander Innes eventually wrote to the Bishop of London and George was brought over to London and it was his way out of the army by doing that, introduced to the Bishop of London, who immediately accepted George as a genuine 
for Mohsen and introduced him to other clergymen. And that began his life and his career as this uh, Formosan imposter. Within a few months of arriving in England, Alexander Innes persuaded George to cash in and he produced this book, an historical and geographical description of Formosa. It was written by uh, George, in, uh, published in, in 1705, and it was an instant sort of bestseller of the time. And the whole of the book is complete nonsense and completely made up. Uh, but it is incredibly detailed about Formosa, all aspects of Formosa, uh, particularly concentrating on the religion because he wanted to make it as irreligious as, it, as possible so that his conversion to the Anglican faith was that much more impressive. So, for instance, uh, G uh, George claimed that um, the Formosans worshipped a sun god and on New Year's Day they used to sacrifice 18,000 small boys to that sun god. Uh, as I say, the first edition sold out pretty quickly and a second edition followed soon after. So the question um, which is fascinating to ask at this stage is how on earth did George get away with it, given that he was a white man with blonde hair? Well, there were several reasons he got away with it. Uh, and listing these, this demonstrates how you know it is possible to be uh, a sort of imposter hoax of the type that George Sarmanazar is. To begin with, he was, by all accounts, a very likable young man. He didn't seem to have any particular vices. He wasn't a drinker. He wasn't a womanizer. He wasn't. He didn't seem to be exploiting his fame for money at all. And what that meant was that those in the Anglican faith who believed in him invested in him because he seemed to be the perfect example of a man who had, um, you know, converted to uh, the Christian religion. Uh, secondly, he was endorsed by the Bishop of London. And if you have an authoritative figure who speaks on your behalf, that is likely to uh, promote the hoax even more. Just to give a, a modern day example, well, I've given one already with Richard, Richard Dimble representing the spaghetti hoax. Uh, clearly, uh, you know, an authoritative broadcaster, more people are like to believe it. When the hit The Diaries came out a few years ago, part of the reason why that got traction was because Trevor Roper, who was a famous historian at the time, he endorsed it, which again meant that other people were likely to do so. So the fact that the Bishop of London was going around saying that George was from Formosa meant that other people would fall into line. He was also a brilliant liar, by which I mean he had a phenomenal memory. And he made a vow very early on that whatever he said about Formosa, however ridiculous, he would never go back on it. And this, again, is a very good way of sustaining a lie. If you just carry on down a straight road and, and never caught out uh, in telling a lie, it's very hard to catch people out. And that was what George was so good at. And part of the reason, actually, he put the 18,000 small boys being sacrificed into the book was because he'd mentioned it in conversation. So the fact that he mentioned it in conversation meant that he felt he ought to put it in the book. Now, before the second edition came out, there was a lot of criticism of that, arguing, well, wouldn't that depopulate the island pretty quickly if 18,000 boys were sacrificed each year? And George's response to that, uh, he didn't take it back, but he just sort of amended it a bit. He said, well, 18,000 was the maximum number that could be sacrificed, but the priests in their discretion could do many less if they wanted to. And in any event, if they ran out of boys, they could always move on to girls. So that was another way of getting out of it. Um, another query that came up was that there were one or two people, not many, who actually had been to Formosa. And they said, well, we've been there. This is nothing like what you're describing in your book. And George's response to that was, well, you probably, and which is factually true, only went to the outskirts of the island. But actually, where I came from, we lived in the centre of an island and we had customs and behaviours very different from the people who lived on the perimeter of the island. Uh, another factor in his favour was that there had actually been a French missionary who'd been over and written about Formosa much earlier on. But what he wrote appeared to be as nonsensical as George. For instance, he claimed that no woman could become pregnant until she reached the age of 37. If she became pregnant before that, then priestesses would lie on the bellies and induce a miscarriage. So George could point that out. He could say, well, if you think my stories about Formosa are ridiculous, uh, how about this one? A couple of other points to make. Um, he was a very good debater. 
Um, and my favorite example of this is a man called Edmund Halley, who later would become the Royal Astronomer, so a very well-known figure, obviously. Um, he tried to catch George out. He said, um, at what angle does the sun hit the hearth in Formosa? George said, I got no idea. Eben Hattie came back and said, well, it's right above the Tropic of Cancer. Of course, it comes directly down the chimney. And George said, well, the problem in Formosa is we have crooked chimneys. So that dealt with that argument. And the final one, how did he get away with the fact that he was a white man with blonde hair? Well, he said that he came from a very wealthy family and they didn't let him outdoors much. And this, of course, shoehorned into the racial stereotype of that time, but the darkness of your skin depended on how much uh, you had the sun on you. So uh, for all these reasons, all these myriad of reasons, uh, George did genuinely get away with it. I can't say that um, I'm sure over over the course of time, people, of course, realised that it, it was uh, probably not true, although George never during his lifetime ever made a confession. He went to his grave claiming that he came from Formosa, but he had to earn his living by other means. And he actually became a, a pretty good sort of what they used to call hack writer back then, somebody who wrote for uh, anonymously for various publications. Um, and towards the end of his life, he became very good friends with Samuel Johnson. In fact, Samuel Johnson said that um, George Salmanazar was the man he most admired. Uh, not for the fact that he was a hoaxer, but because he was a very hardworking individual. Um, we know most of what I've talked about here because this book was published posthumously. George Salmanazar died in 1763, but about 15 years before he'd written a book. Uh, this was it. And in here basically he confesses to his hoaxing. So as we can see, it's called Memoirs of. We never actually discover what his real name is. Um, George Salmanazar was a made-up name by himself, but uh, this was published in 1764, posthumously uh, relating his life. So there we have it, the, the very remarkable story of how George Salmanazar got away with being a Formosan imposter uh, throughout his life by the various means I have mentioned. When it came comes to motivation, slightly hard to understand why he did it, um, but I suspect it was probably... Um, it was clear that from, from his early childhood, he was a bit of a fantasist. He liked playing sort of parts. And I sort of assume partly that he perhaps saw this as a way out. You know, he wasn't going to much going to happen in his life as a sort of um, as a, a working class peasantry Frenchman. But by pretending to be this exotic person from Formosa, he could actually uh, make his way in life and have a reasonably good living uh, which he succeeded in. So I suspect that was uh, perhaps he started it off as a sort of joke, as a sort of fantasist idea, but then realised that if he kept up it, maybe he could um, start a new life, which effectively he did. Um, this hoax, which I want to talk about now, which took place in 1753, I think it's fair to say is the hoax that was most written about of all the hoaxes in the 18th century. There have actually been five full length books written in the 20th century on, on the story. Known uh, The main one, we can see the Canning Enigma, but the other ones as well. Appearance of Truth, the Canning Wonder, the Mystery of Elizabeth Canning, Elizabeth is Missing, are all full length books written on this particular uh, story about Elizabeth Canning. Uh, and there was actually a, a very well known novel uh, written in the 1940s, The Franchise Affair by Josephine Tay, which is all about this story as well. Uh, during the course of um, the Elizabeth Canning case, no less, uh, uh, more than 50 pamphlets were produced about the case, which is double the number of uh, Mary Toft, uh, which is the second most number of pamphlets produced about a, a specific hoax. So you can see the interest in this was absolutely huge. Um, so just to briefly give the story, Elizabeth Canning was a maidservant and uh, she worked for a man called John Lyons. On the 1st of January 1753, uh, she was having a meal with our uncle and aunt and they took her halfway home and she was to walk the rest of the way home. She lived uh, with her employer in near St Paul's, uh, but she never arrived. Um, and she basically went missing for the next 28 days. On the 28th day, so right at the end of January, she returned to her mother uh, in a very dishevelled, emaciated condition, uh, 
and claimed that on her way home, she'd been kidnapped by two ruffians. They'd taken her to a house uh, quite a few miles away uh, outside London. And there she'd been confronted by two women. Uh, one of the women had asked her if she would come their way, by which she meant would she become a prostitute? She refused. So she had her stays cut off and she was then locked in an attic in the house, which was in fact a brothel, for 28 days, she claimed with just a few bits of bread and a broken pitcher of water. After 28 days, she managed to make her escape and returned home to her mother, where she sort of raised the alarm. She didn't know where she'd been kidnapped, but a neighbour from her description reckoned it was Mother Wells's house in Enfield Wash, which was well known as a brothel. So they consulted a magistrate who gave them a warrant and a posse went up and two women were arrested at the house. The owner of the house, who was called Mother Wells, and also an itinerant gypsy called Mary Squires, who was also at the house, who Elizabeth Canning said had cut off her stays. So these were our two sort of protagonists, if you like, in the case. What happened next was that Elizabeth Canning's story was corroborated by a, another woman, a young prostitute who was there, which meant that we now had sort of third had evidence that her story was true. So Mother Wells and Mary Squires went to trial. Uh, the court case was very quick and it lasted less than a day. Both women, unsurprisingly, were found guilty. Mother Wells, the owner of the brothel, was sentenced to six months in Newgate prison and to be branded. Uh, in which she screamed out in pain, apparently, and Mary Squires for destroying property, i.e. the stays of value of more than one shilling, which was considered to be grand larceny in those days, was sentenced to be hanged. So that was the case. And at this stage, uh, just after the trial, of course, all sympathy were very much with Elizabeth Canning. She was uh, a young, innocent, it would seem, uh, maidservant. Uh, Mary Squires was not the most attractive of women. She was actually a hunchback. And there was a lot of anti-gypsy propaganda and feeling at the time. Um, and she was often depicted as a witch, as you can see in this engraving here. That is Mary Squires being depicted flying on a broomstick. However, soon after the trial uh, had finished, um, it began to a little bit unravel a bit because Mary Squires had claimed at the trial that she wasn't actually at Enfield Wash where the kidnapping took place. She was actually in Abbotsbury in Dorset. And there were a few witnesses at the trial who tried to argue that case. But basically their evidence had been dismissed. But um, a man called Sir Chris Gascoigne, who was the Lord Mayor at the time, started to uh, make a dossier of other witnesses who claim that Mary Squires was actually in Abbotsbury in Dorset at the time of the alleged kidnapping. At the same time, the corroborative evidence by the young woman who was called Virtue Hall, rather ironically, she was a whore, although it was spelled H-A-L-L, -L, and um, she actually confessed that uh, she hadn't told the truth. Uh, basically, she'd heard Elizabeth Canning's story and she just repeated it. And these two pieces of evidence, if you like, meant that uh, Mary Squires's ex, uh, hanging was uh, she was, it was given a stay of execution on the 10th of April 1753. And then in May, the following month, uh, she was completely pardoned because uh, it was Elizabeth Canning who was now going on trial. Um, it's quite amusing, actually, this um, engraving here, the speech bubble that Mary Squires is saying, as being a witch, I can be in Abbotsbury and Enfield Wash both at the same time. So uh, now, from having a trial of Mary Squires, we now had a trial of Elizabeth Canning for perjury. It actually took quite a long time for the trial to take place. Uh, Elizabeth Canning sort of went into hiding and uh, there were lots of sort of affidavits and drawing all the evidence together. So the trial actually only took place in the following year in 1754. And during that period, all these pamphlets, which I mentioned, were produced. And there really were a huge number. Um, the most famous was probably by uh, Henry Fielding. Henry Fielding, who is well known today, of course, for being the author of Tom Brown, um, a foundling. Um, 
anyway, he produced one of the pamphlets. Um, he actually originally heard the evidence of Elizabeth Canning gave because he was a magistrate by this stage in his life. And he absolutely believed it. He felt that Elizabeth Canning was telling the truth. His main rival was a man called Dr. Hill. And as soon as Henry Fielding produced his pamphlet, you know, saying that Elizabeth Canning was telling the truth, uh, Dr. Hill produced his contrary pamphlet to say, basically, uh, Elizabeth Canning had made the whole story up. Um, and looking objectively at the two pamphlets, it must be said that Dr. Hill probably uh, wins over Henry Fielding. One of the arguments, actually, that Henry Fielding made was that Elizabeth Canning probably didn't have the wit to make up the story, i.e. the intelligence. And Dr. Hill had quite a good riposte to that. He said, um, no one knows better how much wit is required for the writing of books. But to do justice to your last performance, no one knows with how small a share of it they may be written. And that was a reference to uh, Henry Fielding's uh, final book, which was called Amelia, which was critically and uh, panned and also wasn't popular with the public. So uh, a little bit of a dig by Dr. Hill about uh, Henry Fielding's rather patronising comment that Elizabeth Canning wouldn't have the wit to make up the story. If you think they were patronising in the 18th century, I would just draw your attention. Some of you might remember Pledgate, uh, Andrew Mitchell, uh, the Tory politician, was accused of calling a policeman a pleb and uh, went to trial on it and lost the trial. He, he sued for, for slander, but uh, the judge ruled that, no, he almost certainly had said uh, that the policeman was a pleb. And part of his argument was as follows. He is not the sort of man, i.e. the policeman, who had the wit to invent in the spur of the moment what a senior cabinet minister would have said to him. So we think we were patronising in the 18th century. We were still patronising in the 2020. 2012 it took place, so the 21st century, I can say. So the point is that the, uh, the Elizabeth Canning uh, case went to court and um, it lasted no less than six days, which was an unprecedented length of time. And the reason it lasted so long is there were lots of witnesses who said that Elizabeth, that Mary Squires was in Abbott Street at the time and a whole load of other witnesses who said she was in Enfield Wash. So the jury had to determine which was telling the truth. Uh, was it the, as I say, the Abbotry witnesses or the Enfield Wash witnesses? And the quandary which happened at the time is actually caught quite nicely in this engraving here, which I bought a few years ago. It's called the Cundras 1753. When I bought it, I, I knew nothing about this hoax and I actually thought that these three gentlemen here were three well-known uh, British Cundras of the 18th century, the equivalent, if you like, of um, iconic magicians of the 20th and the 21st magicians. But it turned out, no, they weren't. They were just uh, trying to determine the case. So what we have here is Elizabeth Canning on one side. We've got Mary Squires on the other side. Uh, this is Henry Fielding showing his support for Elizabeth Canning. This is uh, Sir John Hill showing his support for Mary Squires. And we've got Sir Chris Gascoigne in the middle, who's basically trying to arbitrate between the two of them. So um, it's, it's a fascinating case. Um, uh, in the end, uh, Elizabeth Canning was found uh, guilty of perjury. But um, fascinatingly, she went to her. Uh, she wasn't hanged. She was actually transported to America where she lived out the rest of her life. Uh, she always insisted, insisted she was telling the truth. At no point uh, did she retract her evidence. And even today, people are not 100 percent sure whether it was a hoax. Was it uh, a diabolical kidnapping case or was it a diabolical hoax? Who knows? We really not 100 percent sure. I have my own judgment on it, which um, um, I make. But uh, other people might have a different. Well, I know other people have a different judgment on it as well. Um, and I think if this case actually went to court today, leaving aside you know, DNA analysis of whether Elizabeth Canning was actually in the attic and leaving aside perhaps CCT coverage of her trip, uh, Mary Squires' trip supposedly from Abbotsbury to Enfield Wash, I really don't know that we would know, you know, whether she was telling the truth or not. Uh, the court transcript runs to 400 pages, so you can absolutely read the whole case in full. And the questions asked are very pertinent, just the type of question we might ask today. And the answer is, at the end of the day, we're really not quite sure who was telling the truth. And the final point to make about this is the motivation. Um, We've got no idea what the motivation of Elizabeth Canning was, if indeed she was the hoaxer. So this is the one hoax in my book where I really cannot tell you 
what her motivation was for it. Why would she make up the fact that she'd been kidnapped in this way to explain her absence for 28 days? Um, I'm just going to talk very briefly about one final hoax before, um, because I appreciate I'm perhaps running a little bit over time. I apologise. Um, before just very quickly summarising, uh, this final hoax um, actually took place in 1796, where a man called William Henry Ireland uh, claimed that he'd found a Shakespearean play. And again, the motivation behind this is rather fascinating because he wasn't selling off the documentation. He was actually giving it to his father, who was an obsessive uh, Shakespearean collector. So one feels that maybe the reason for the hoax was to ingratiate himself with his father. Uh, but other people have argued, well, no, he was doing it for other reasons, to humiliate Shakespeare and experts and to try and make a point or whatever. But anyway, lots of different possible motivations. But uh, part of the interest, which I briefly want to touch on, is how did he get away with it? Because I think if he just produced a Shakespearean play um, and said, look, I've discovered this play, nobody would have believed him. But he very cleverly built it up. Basically, he allegedly had met a man called Mr. H who had a closet full of Shakespearean ephemera and he slowly, you know, produced this Shakespearean documentation. But he started off with very boring documentation. This is actually the very first. It was just a bill of exchange. Uh, the exciting part was the uh, Shakespearean signature. That's what sort of turned his dad on. And then after that, he produced sort of banal business letters. Uh, he produced a letter uh, written supposedly by Shakespeare to the Earl of Leicester. Uh, and the Earl of Southampton, which we can see here. Uh, he produced another letter, which apparently was written by Elizabeth uh, to Shakespeare. So none of these were particularly exciting. But I think what he did was he he drew his father in. So the father sort of accepted the lesser documentation, which meant when eventually he produced an entire play, supposedly written by Shakespeare, uh, his father was unable to sort of go back on it because uh, if he said any of the documentation was false, that sort of unraveled the whole thing. So it was a very clever way of sort of drawing his father in by starting off with something very mundane. Who on earth would bother to forge a bill of exchange? You know, uh, there's absolutely no point. There's no value in it. Uh, and eventually came up with a, an entire play. So again, a, a very clever way of catching, uh, of drawing somebody in and pulling off this particular hoax. So um, I hopefully by that I've sort of summarised uh, three or four really interesting hoaxes, I hope, um, and the motivation of them and also how they manage to succeed in pulling them off. Um, this is William Henry Ireland himself, by the way. So uh, finally, just to conclude, um, in writing the book, I, I think I've reached three main conclusions, whether you would agree with them or not, that that's up to you. The first one is there is no one reason what the people carry our hoaxes. It can range from a bit of fun to revenge to drawing attention to yourself and everything in between. Every single hoax in my book, there is a different motivation for that person to carry out the hoax. And often, as I say, it's not necessarily that benign, as we discovered with Elizabeth Canning. Uh, it could have resulted in the hanging of Mary Squires, but it can be also uh, much more playful and fun. Uh, my second conclusion is, there were very good reasons why people fall for hoaxes. To dismiss anybody who falls for a hoax as stupid and gullible is far too simplistic. Um, and I think hopefully I, I've made that point. Um, and even the Mary Toft hoax, I don't have time to go into it now, but there were very good reasons why Mary Toft fell, sorry, people fell for the Mary Toft hoax uh, about supposedly giving birth to rabbits. It wasn't because they were stupid and gullible. There was much more involved with that. And my third conclusion is people were no more naive back in the 18th century than they are now. Human nature really hasn't altered one iota. And I think you only have to look at people who are falling for um, both fake news and, and hoaxes uh, to perhaps agree with that conclusion. My favourite hoax of all, just to really finish up, is the Bottle Cundra hoax that took place in 1740 man. 1749, where a man claimed that he would climb inside a bottle on the stage of the new theatre in the Haymarket. This is a genuine wine bottle, and he would sing and dance inside the bottle. And believe it or not, uh, on the night of the January the 16th, 1749, the theatre was pretty much packed out. Unfortunately, although the audience turned up, the performer did not. And that was the beginning of the Bottle Cundra hoax.
I haven't got time to go into detail of that, but that I think is my favorite because it is the most fun hoax. And as I'm a magician myself, um, you might ask yourself, can I, Ian Keeble, perform the Bottle Conjurer hoax? Well, the answer is, of course, I can. So here I am. That's the bottle. Um, the bottles back in the 18th century were opaque, but anyway, we'll use a slightly more modern day bottle. That's the implement needed. And off I go to perform the famous Bottle Conjurer hoax as not performed on the 16th of January. 1749 but this is almost certainly how the man should have done it so thank you very much indeed if you are interested in learning more about the other hoaxes and more detailed of course about some of the hoaxes i've talked about please feel free to at least um, think about uh, pursuing this book uh, my book the century of deception the birth of the hoax in 18th century england thank you very much indeed for listening and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Ian. I didn't expect to beat my personal hero, Jonathan Swift tonight, but I'm always <laughs> pleased when he comes up. <laughs> so thank you for that. Ian has kindly given us a link and a code for a discount for his book. So if you go to sakibooks.com, that's S-A-Q-I books.com, and you use the code MAGIC5, you'll get five pounds off the hardback and the ebook version. That code again is MAGIC5, or one word, five is spelled out, it's not the digit. Good. We will now have a short break for drinks to be filled, pits to be stopped, doggies to be walked, or anything else you need to do. Um, a short reminder, you can now put in your questions at sitp.online slash ask, where you can also see the questions that already have been put up. There's quite a number already. Um, and if you like any of those questions, you can vote them up. We will actually use that popularity as a rough guide on how we go through the list of the questions. So if you want to help us pick out the most important or the best questions, please have a look and upvote some. That's it for me for now. Have a nice break. We'll be back at 10 minutes past eight UK time. Welcome back. Thanks for all the questions so far. Please keep them coming even though we're starting the Q&A very soon. Again, the link sitp.online forward slash ask. Also, just a reminder, after this talk, we will open up the Lockins Razor again, our regular virtual pub on Zoom where we can all get together and have a chat. And I've heard through the grapevine that there is discussions about my shelf in the back. <laughs> um, I'll be back presenting in six weeks time. Um, let me know in the chat, do you want me to clean up my, uh, my shelf or shall I leave it like that? I'll leave it up to you guys. Okay, let's go into the questions. The first questions I have, Ian, is uh, it comes from Paul, also known as Picticule. It takes a period of time for a story's hoax status to become apparent. Oh, sorry, if it takes a period of time. What are the chances that some supposedly historical stories are in fact hoaxes? Uh, right. Uh, okay. But yeah, that, that's a, a question which has uh, certainly thrown me, um, as I'm not quite, I'm not sure how I would know the answer to that, if you see what I mean. Um, because you're, you're basically saying, is something that we think is factually correct a hoax? Well, <laughs> if, if we knew it was, if we knew it was a hoax, then we would know it was a hoax. But if we, if it was factually correct, I'm getting confused by my own logic here, but do you understand where I'm, I'm coming from? <laughs> I think I do. Okay. How would you answer that, Gerald? Let's, let's turn it back to you. <laughs> it, it, it takes us back to, who was it? Rumsfeld, the known unknowns and the known knowns. And yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, yeah, it's, it's possible, isn't it? That um, some things which we, which we think are, are factual at the moment could well be hoaxes, but we would only know in the course of time, I guess. Yeah. Um, it's, it's difficult to judge from now what we will know in the future. Yeah, but going back to the 18th century, whether, there's, whether there is stuff in the 18th century which we accept as a fact, but was actually a, a hoax. Yeah, your guess is as good as mine, I guess. Yeah, yeah. true. Good. Cleo has got a question for us. With the rapid communication and omnipresent online opinions we have now, are hoaxes more or less likely to be believed compared to the 18th century? 
Yeah, it's it's a difficult one, that one. I, I think it's probably fair to say that uh, a, a hoax as big as uh, the Elizabeth Canning case or the Mary Toff case would mm-hmm. unlikely to be replicated today. Um, because, I mean, something like the Mary Toff, the supposedly giving birth to rabbits, was one that uh, was apparently the, the course of conversation amongst, uh, you know, everybody at the time. There were there were complaints in the papers that nobody was talking about anything else apart from Mary Toft and therefore other news couldn't actually be broadcast or, or heard about. Uh, it was said that the, uh, the producers of rabbits complained because the consumption of rabbits declined by something like two thirds over the period of the Mary Toft case. So it really was <laughs> a, a huge event. And I, and I don't think today you would probably have a hoax which would be that extensive. But that's not to say that myriad of hoaxes can emerge, particularly on the uh, on the Internet, uh, perhaps, because people tend just to look at those matters that they're particularly interested in. You know, it's the old sort of confirmation bias. We we associate ourselves with people and we look at um references which uh, which we are broadly in agreement with and therefore if a sort of hoax is going to work amongst a, a number of, of people um, then yeah the, then I can see sort of niche hoaxes being just as um, just as prevalent as they were in the 18th century but I can't really see a, a hoax of the size if you like of, of the of those that took place in in the 18th century I think we, we have the facility to uh, to very quickly determine whether something is a hoax or not in this day and age because of the access to to the internet, which of course they didn't have back in the 18th century. Uh, things moved much slower. Um, you know, how could you prove that George Simonazar didn't come from Formosa unless you, you know, actually went over to Formosa and actually met up with the natives there to determine? Yeah. That, no, there's nothing like he's determining. So much harder to to expose a hoax, if you like. But um, as far as niche hoaxes are, are involved, I think they're probably just as prevalent as they were uh, back in 18th century. I also think with the modern facilities we have to do fact checking, I guess it takes a lot of work to set up a convincing hoax. It, it does, although, it, I mean, it's interesting. This wasn't actually a hoax at all, but some of you might know about um, Naomi Wolf, who was the... Um, uh, the feminist who was caught out with her book, where she claimed that a lot of a, a lot of men in the 19th century were executed uh, because they were uh, because they were homosexual and sort of sodomy. Um, and this came out in a book uh, I, I come anyhow two or three a couple of years ago, um, and she was caught out by a interview on Radio Three by the presenter who'd done his research. And he discovered that um, she thought the term death recorded against an individual's name meant that that person had been executed or hanged. But actually, it was a way it wasn't it didn't mean that at all. It actually meant that it was a way the judges were basically saying, well, this is uh, an offence which uh, under normal circumstances you might be hanged for, but we're not going to hang you at all because, you know, we just don't think it's the right punishment for this type of thing. So but they okay. used to use this term death recorded. And Naomi Wolf genuinely made this mistake. I mean, she thought that death recorded meant that they were hanged. Mm. So the whole basis of her book rather sort of uh, collapsed. It was highly embarrassing for her and, of course, very amusing for other uh, literary authors of that time. So even... And that it was only uncovered by, you know, a little bit of digging by the uh, by the Radio Free presenter. But, you know, it got by the publishers, it got by other people who presumably had read the book as well. So it shows that even today, you know, you think surely all facts can easily be checked up. Well, in theory, they, they should be, but often they're not. Um, and I think that goes partly down to journalism today. I mean, um, uh, the. Um, yeah, the, the, the whole fact that um, press, you know, a lot of newspapers made up of press releases, as we, as we know. In fact, wasn't there a talk by somebody recently yeah. on that from, from you? That yeah. was my, Mike Marshall. Mike Marshall absolutely made, made the point absolutely brilliantly, you know, that um, the journalists no longer check facts. They just accept what is put in. So it's actually quite easy, probably quite easy to get mm. to get a hoax into the paper and for people to believe it. Yeah. But would I just thinking about 
are you aware, uh, familiar with the Carlos hoax that uh, Amazing Randy played in Australia, I think in the early 80s, where he basically introduced a supposedly Brazilian wonder healer, miracle healer who was coming to Australia and he established his backstory various, very, uh, by various TV interviews and apparently the whole um, Australian publicity or public just fell for it. Would it be still possible to do something like that today? Yeah, well, um, I've sometimes asked about, uh, you know, is the equivalent of George Simanazar, and I, I think Yuri Geller is actually a very good example of that. I mean, Yuri Geller, who um, claimed that he could bend spoons when he first appeared yeah. on British television, and he appeared actually on da the David Dimbleby show, is where mm -hmm. the son of, um, of Richard Dimbleby, who I mentioned about the spaghetti hoax, and he appeared on the, the David Dimbleby show and uh, supposedly bent spoons by the power of his mind. And of course, there was this scientist, John Taylor, who was also a panelist on the show, who was totally taken in and then, you know, it, uh, and completely ruined his career because he then went off into <laughs> investigating uh, spoon bending uh, and actually produced a book about it, I think, something like sort of <laughs> mind benders or something. Uh, okay. Highly embarrassing for him. I mean, little boys were sort of, you know, he was <laughs> supposedly, you know, leaving little boys alone in the room with a spoon. And when they came back, surprise, surprise, it'd been bent. <laughs> and uh, John Taylor was totally convinced that this was genuine. I mean, this is a very good reason which sort of Randy stresses is you ne never get scientists to um, to try to test whether somebody is a hoaxer or because they are the most gullible people possible. Um, they, yeah. de they, they can't understand the concept of cheating to begin with because they're brought up on a scientific basis. They think that everybody must be uh, rational and, uh, you know, incapable of cheating. Uh, and also they, they tend to be fairly arrogant and therefore think that they their own judgment is better than uh, actually checking up on facts. But anyway, um, yeah, but so basically Yuri Geller, and I think when Yuri Geller burst on the scene, I reckon that 90% of people who saw him probably believed mm -hmm. he was genuine. Um, but obviously over the years, I hope that well over 90% realise that, uh, of course, he's just a very good uh, magician. But he's similar to George Simanazar in the fact that uh, he's never actually said that he's um, cheated. He, he And I think he will probably go to his grave claiming that he can generally bend spoons mm. by the power of his mind. So, yeah, yeah it, 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 I, I think it is it is possible. Um, and I think more and more people today, I'd, I'd love to know what the percentage of the people who get genuinely believe in ghosts or in psychic experiences. But I reckon it would probably be well over 50 percent of the populace probably believe in uh, the possibility of psychic uh, weird mm -hmm. ghost-like experiences of some sort um, which means that if you get somebody who's extremely clever and manages to hit the zeitgeist that it's possible they could take people in yeah that's true okay back to the questions grady earthling asks did the printing press or other ways of propagating stories more efficiently increase the number of hoaxes did the hoaxes get more fantastical? I, I don't think it increased um, the number of hoaxes, but I think it, it set, what it did do was it uh, it meant that um, they were circulated and went um, went viral, if you like, the 18th century mm. equivalent of going viral. I mean, I, I, one of the hoaxes which I talk about in my book was a, by Benjamin Franklin, the uh, one of the founding fathers who made up this speech, which... Um, was published in the in the Daily Advertiser, which was a, a newspaper in uh, 1747, and uh, the speech was was totally made up. It was a fake speech, but it was reproduced by the other newspapers of the time. It was then reproduced in the monthly magazines, but then it actually went overseas to America and arrived in America. Okay. Uh, it took a couple of months to get across because of um, you know transporting by by sea, but then it appeared in all the American newspapers as well. Um, and it was even picked up by uh, historians and a couple of history books. The speech appears in has been a genuine speech right through actually till uh, 1910. There was a, quite a well-known social history of America. And the speech, again, part of the speech is reproduced to demonstrate uh, it was tr showing how women were supposedly badly treated in America at the time. So, yeah, um, and the printing press therefore spreads the story very much. Um, 
in the same way that the internet does now. It's just um, a rather slower procedure. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, I, I think it certainly, um, you know, sends hoaxes uh, further afield so they become more, whether it produces more hoaxes. Um, yeah, possibly so, you know, because you've got a, a means of, um, of making up stories and planting them in newspapers, basically. Yeah, um, if they if they sell well, there'll be more of them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. OK, we've got a question from Igor. Why is there so many hoaxers with no apparent financial motive? Is it just a desire for fame or is there some other psychological phenomenon? Yeah, well, this comes down to the, the point that I was sort of making that every single hoax which I looked at seemed to have a, a, a different motive attached to it. So you just really have to look at the the, the individual um, the individual hoax and determine what the what the reason is. Um, I mean, obviously, a, a hoax can have a financial motive, but um, I just think, as I say, that if it does, that it tends to drift over into being a sort of scam or a con which you could argue is a subset of a hoax. I mean, you know, you could get into semantics of definitions. Mm. It's just my own sort of definition, which I've set. So it, it's just, you just have to look at the individual concerned, really, uh, the hoaxer and determine why why they've done it. And it can be, um, as I say, just for sort of fun or to get their revenge on somebody or humiliate somebody. Um I mean, personally, I'm not on the whole a great fan of hoaxes because they do tend to have an element of often an element of cruelty about them. Uh, the humour arises from making somebody look a bit stupid or a bit silly or humiliating them. Um, uh, so on, on a personal level, I, I, you know, I'm not a I'm not a great fan. I rather cringe sometimes if you see a lot of pranks which are done on on uh. youtube and things like that where you're sort of making people look a bit silly the fun hoaxes are great uh, you know i enjoy a fun hoax like everybody else but um yeah i'm sorry it's one of those questions that you can't really answer um certainly there's psychological flaws in why some people do hoaxes but for other reasons it may just be as i say for fun or um you know other other just other reasons or to get their own back on somebody so it's it's very hard to to pin it down which is why it makes it a you know an interesting area i think what is yeah. the motivation behind behind hoaxes <clears throat> definitely we've got another question from parrot lady what are your own personal thoughts about elizabeth canning and the way she and what really happened Right. I'm tempted to say buy the book, which is what I should say, isn't it, really? Uh, then you can read what I say. Um, well, I, I uh, but I have to be, I have to answer the question, to be fair. Uh, thank, what, what was it? Parrot Lady, was it? Or Parrot? Parrot Lady, yeah. Parrot Lady, okay. Yeah. Uh, such a great name, but I feel obliged. Yeah, um, well, I, I actually think the, um, my gut feeling is that she probably was a genuine hoaxer. Uh, but she had made the story up. And my, my primary reason for thinking that actually is um, Mary Squires was an itinerant gypsy traveling around the country. Now, if she had kidnapped her and kept her for 28 days in this condition and then discovered, as obviously she would have done, that Elizabeth Canning had made her escape, mm. surely she would have gone on the run. She wouldn't have just sat in the house and waited for the authorities yeah. to come and, and get her. That's my main argument uh for um for the reason that i think that she had made the story up and again if you go into great detail which they absolutely do you can see the sort of contrary information which elizabeth canning does but it's um that sort of suggests that um she doesn't know the house as well as she sort of pretends that she does mm -hmm. and that uh, when she you know when she first came to the house with the posse that possibly was the first time that she'd actually come to it um the reason, the best reason that people have come up with as a possible motive is that maybe she got pregnant and um, she'd gone away for 28 days to either have the baby or to have a miscarriage or whatever. And um, she was embarrassed about that. And uh, it's possible um, the person who actually said that Elizabeth Canning was staying at this house was a neighbour who possibly was her lover. So okay. there is a possibility that the two of them set it up together, but it still sounds really, really convoluted. 
um, to do and, you know, not something you feel you could possibly sustain over such a long period, uh, which she clearly did. You know, she uh, she never, you know, backed down and she was very, very convincing. So I, I don't know. I really... I'm really a bit stumped. Um, and a lot of people have said, well, apparently she was very thoroughly examined and she hadn't had a baby and there's no evidence. Uh, although they did say that she possibly wasn't a virgin <laughs> rather ungallantly, but um, uh, there was no evidence that she'd, you know, had a baby or miscarriage. So, you know, who knows? Yeah. Okay. By the way, Parrot Lady, that code for the book was Magic 5. <laughs> if you want to read it up yourself. Okay. I, I, sh I should say, actually, that there is one book by um, written by a feminist called Judith Moore, which is The Appearance of Truth, which is actually the last full length book on Elizabeth Canning. And she's a bit exceptional because she absolutely takes Elizabeth Canning's side. She genuinely okay. believes that, um, uh, that Elizabeth Canning was uh, was telling the truth. And uh, she thinks that it was a sort of conspiracy that the uh, the witnesses in Abbotsbury were actually sort of bribed and given money to come up with their side of the story. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, you know, there isn't there really isn't one one view on this at all. So, yeah. Good. Another question from Igor. Is there a significant difference between stories of deliberate hoaxes and stories of people who sincerely believe in their crazy? What, who who actually believe in in who genuinely what, believe the, the story that they're telling? Yeah. Oh, you mean oh the the, the individual who's who is hoaxing is yes. actually believes genuinely that, believe. That's how I understand the question. Yes. Right. Um, because he's a psychopath, or because he, <laughs> or he's delusional. Or I don't know. Um, I mean, um, I'm, I'm sure people do convince themselves. Um, you, you do hear about this, that, that if you, you, you know, if you repeat a, a story enough, enough times, I think you can convince yourself that the story might possibly be true. Um, I mean, certainly people who believe in, you know, who say they've seen a ghost genuinely believe that they've seen a ghost. And there's no point in arguing with them. Uh, it's yeah. a complete waste of time. Um, you know, however much you say, well, it could be due to this or it could be due to that. Um, you know, if they think they saw something uh they are going to stick with that and you know quite a lot of experiments have been done that the more actually you argue with somebody uh the more likely they are to just to firm up on their own position and people also as i'm sure everybody watching is aware uh, tend to believe in emotions their own emotions and their own feelings more than they do in facts and the more facts you produce to try to discount their theory the more they um, think their theory is correct. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm sure. Um, I mean, I, I can't think of, of somebody, if you like, who made up a hoax story whilst believing it at the time, if you see what I mean. If, if you see, I, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Uh, somebody who, it, it'd be quite hard to get my head around that in the sense that mm. they've made up the story, but they're believing that the story is true. As they, as they, I mean, you'd have to be uh, probably have some sort of mental illness probably to fall into that, you know, like a schizophrenic or somebody to fall into that. <clears throat> yeah, the, the, the switch from making something up to believing it. I think there are specific requirements for that. Yeah. Yeah, I suspect so. Uh, certainly at, at the time of making it up, if you like. But as I say, if you tell the same story enough times, I think you can convince yourself that it's um, that it's true, which is a slightly different yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. True. Good. Next question from Matt. What is the oldest known hoax that you're aware of? The oldest known hoax that I'm aware of? Um, yeah, I mean... Um, I do tend to stick to the 18th century, I must say. So once I sort of go outside that that era, I'm not I'm not quite so good. Um, I think um, one of the very earliest April Fool jokes, which they they talk about, um, and I'm trying to remember the details about this. It was a they um, they sort of sent invites to people to go and see the lions. Um, I'm, I, I'm saying Trafalgar Square, but I don't think it was. And okay. it, was, it was a slightly sort of bizarre hoax where people were, were fooled into thinking that they would go and see some some sort of live lions. So, okay. uh, 
uh, and that's part of the sort of the beginnings of of April Fool. But um, I think, but I'm I'm sure there were hoaxes. I mean, I'm sure if you go back to Roman times or you know even earlier Egyptian times, I'm sure there were hoaxes perpetrated there. But it's not something I've um, I, I've studied. I'm afraid. So yeah. um, that's fine. Sometimes yeah. I don't know is as good enough an answer as any other. Good. Uh, we've yeah, got another so question. I should have said that quicker, shouldn't I, really? I don't know. <laughs> That's fine. I'll translate. Um, we've got another question from Parrot Lady. Did a majority of people really truly fall for the hoaxes, or was it more a fun way of keeping the trick going and seeing who can, who you can trick by retelling it? Uh, yeah, I, th I think in, in the hoaxes which I look at, uh, I think people genuinely did fall for them. Yeah, I, I, I really do. I, d I don't think there was this element of, um, oh, yeah, we'll just um, repeat the hoax uh, to, to try to fool our friends, which, of course, we might yeah. we might do now. You know, we would send somebody a video we'd seen, which was, a, you know, a fake video and, uh, mm. and, and hopefully get them to believe in it and not realize that it was uh, faked in any way. But no, I, I think back then uh, people, uh, you know, as I say, the most ridiculous hoax on the surface is the Mary Toff giving birth to rabbits. And there's no doubt about it, a huge number of people believed in it. And even yeah. the intellectuals of the time were torn, you know, that they, they write, I'm not sure if the story is true or it's not true. They, they really okay. didn't, didn't know. So, no, I, I think most of the hoaxes, which I look at, certainly people, um, yeah, those people who said they fell for it or, uh, you know, just, just did. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Another question from Igor. What should we do to combat hoaxes and hoaxers, and can we actually do anything about them? Well, to begin with, do we really want to do anything about them? I think they're quite fun, really. Um, it's, it's only a hoax when it turns into a... It's only when it comes to a conspiracy theory, really. Yeah. Uh, and as I say, by my definition, a hoax is not a conspiracy theory. It's, 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 gr it's outgrown it. So if you're asking me, what do we do about conspiracy theories? I mean, that's... Um, uh, you know, God knows is the answer. Different uh, talk, yeah. <laughs> it, it's a different talk, really. Uh, you know, I have some thoughts on it, but I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I'm sure everybody listening have their own thoughts. And uh, what 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 is what is sure, which I mentioned earlier, is the more facts you produce to try to uh, demonstrate that their conspiracy theory is nonsense, the more they will counteract it with, you know, with another fact on top of your fact to demonstrate why your fact is incorrect. So at the end of the day, it's probably just not worth discussing or even ar yeah. arguing. Um, but as far as um, hoaxes are concerned, um, I, you know, I, I, I do, I do think that they can be quite fun um, and quite enjoyable. I think we enjoy pranking people as long as, as I say, they're, they're not cruel hoaxes, which I, I don't like. But a, but a fun hoax, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, particularly, it's only when it sort of gets out of control, if you like, and actually causes. Um, people upset or as I say it develops into a conspiracy theory that uh, yeah. I think it could become dangerous to society where's your fun Eagle where's your fun <laughs> <laughs> okay we have uh, well we only got two questions left Dr. X Dispicy I don't know how to pronounce that I apologize uh, the question is were hoaxes perpetrated more often by and on the landed gentry compared to poorer workers? Were they perpetrated on the landed gentry as opposed or to... Or by the gentry also, I think. Or, but by. So were the perpetrators tended to be... Um, so, yeah, were the were the perpetrators landed gentry as opposed to working working people? Is it, yes, yeah. and, and also who were the people who were fooled. He, right. He's asking both. Yeah, no, I'm with you. Okay, I, I'm with the question now. I, I've got my head around that. Well, what, what's interesting actually is that uh, of the uh, the ten hoaxes in my book, um, four of them are by women, and six of them are by men. And on the whole, apart from George Sarmanazar, who came from a lowly French peasantry family, nearly all the male hoaxers are uh, powerful men. Uh, you know, men of uh, of substance. Um, I mean, I've already mentioned Benjamin Franklin. I have mentioned mm. Jonathan Swift, so that's two of them. Another one was perpetrated by um, by a very wealthy individual. Um, there is, uh, but all the 
the, the female perpetrators of the hoaxes were all um, women from, you know, from the working classes, if we can use that term for the 18th century. Uh, so they tended to be the poor people, okay. uh, the people. So it's very interesting. It's a, it seems to be a sort of male female divide that the, the male hoaxes are on the noble side, if you like, whereas the female are very much on the working class side of things. Not quite sure why that is, but that uh, that is certainly the fact of, um, of 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 the hoaxes that I looked at. Uh, as to who fell for the hoax, it, no, it, it seemed to it seems to hit all, all classes of of people. I mean, Elizabeth Canning um, certainly. Uh, there were both, you know, people like Henry Fielding, who you couldn't get anybody more intelligent than him, who fell for the hoax, if you like. Uh, but also, um, you know, the working people. Most of them yeah. supported okay. Elizabeth Canning, um, uh, and and the other hoaxes were divided equally. So I don't think it had any um, any sort of class distinction about who actually fell for the hoax. But the perpetrators of the hoax, yeah, there was very much a clear divide between the the male female divide. Okay, mm. interesting. Good. Final question. I know you are prepared. Um, we're getting asked by Andrew. Uh, please, could you show us a trick? I won't hold my breath for you pulling your cat out of a hat because we know uh, your cat is a little bit shy when it comes to <laughs> appearing on camera. So we won't ask you for that. But yeah, the question stands. Could you show us a trick? Well, show us a trick. Yes, the, the cat out of the hat trick. Although, of course, it is the rabbit out of the hat trick. <laughs> um, interesting, actually, a, a lot of people, well, some people felt that Mary Toff producing rabbits out of, uh, out of herself actually influenced or suggested magicians produce rabbits out of the hat um, okay. yeah the, 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 some people felt that there was a link but actually um a, a well-known magic historian a man called dr edwin dawes who i must give a shout to he's he's uh, in his 90s now he's uh, the most distinguished magic historian around and uh, he showed that no there was no connection uh, partly because the hats used in georgian times were not the traditional victorian top hat which is what you need okay. to produce a rabbit from. And also, in fact, the first rabbit out of a hat didn't actually happen until uh, the 1830s, uh, which was over 100 years after Mary Toft. So I can put that one to rest. There is no connection between Mary <laughs> Good Toft. Good to know. Good to know, just in case anybody felt there would be. So, uh, yes, um, Andrew has asked me for a trick. Um, okay, um, I will attempt this over Zoom. I'm just going to uh, take off my headphones and switch on my speaker. Um, okay. Yep. You can hear me. I can hear you. Yes, we can yep. hear still, still hear you. So point. it's going to be it's going to be a card trick. I'm going to have to do this with you, Gerald. Um, okay. Um, I'm just going to move back a bit and move my camera a little bit. So I'm probably missed the top of my head, but that's all right. It's just so you can see the cards a bit better. Um, so I'm going to do a card trick with the pack of cards, which you can okay. see here. And uh, what I would normally do is have a card uh, selected by your good self, but obviously that's quite okay. hard to do over, over Zoom. So, um, and I would also ask you to shuffle the pack first, but I'll have to do that myself. So I'll just give the pack a quick shuffle. So as I can't ask you to take a card, um, I'm going to have to we'll do it by another way. Okay, shuffle the cards here. Um, Okay, as I just go through the cards like this, you just have to call out stop wherever you like. Okay, stop please. Stop there, okay. So uh, the card you stopped me is this top one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the card. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try and look away so I can't uh, see it myself. But uh, okay. can you see that card? Yes, yes. I can you, see And it. you'll be able to remember it, okay? Yes. Yeah, and hopefully everybody else can see it as well. So I'll just place it back in the pack. And um, normally I would give the pack to you to shuffle again, but obviously I'm going to have to do this myself. In fact, to really show off, I'm going to give it a quick. Uh... <laughs> that's just what I would have done. Yeah, that's that's yeah, fine. That's for you. Then. <laughs> 20 years of self-denial in that, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, so what's going to happen in a moment, Gerald, is one card is going to leap out of the pack. It's okay. going to make um, four revolutions in the air. It might be five, might be three. I'm not going to count. Um, hopefully, I'm going to catch the card. That's not guaranteed. <laughs> And hopefully it will also be your card. So here we go. Oh, I caught it. <laughs> here we are. So one card. Let me show that to the camera. Um, there it is. 
And I can confirm that it's the same card. That was the same card. Thank you very much. So there we go. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, it is okay. a ordinary pack of cards, I do promise you. So <laughs> I'll yes. have to take your word for it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ian. That was very interesting and very enlightening. I enjoyed that a lot. Good. Um, let's see. What do I have to say? Oh, yeah. Two weeks time. Our next talk. I think we will be talking about meteorology. Mike Rothschild will talk about the storm is upon us. How QAnon became a movement, cult and conspiracy theory of everything. OK, I don't think that's about the weather at all. <laughs> so, yeah, Mike Rothschild in two weeks time about QAnon. Please feel free to join us again. We're looking forward to it, and hopefully so will many of you. Final reminder, we're opening the logins razor in a few minutes. Join us in our online pub on Zoom if you want to. And by the way, I'm not sure we talked about it enough so far. We are also opening the pub on Thursdays when we do not have a talk scheduled. And then normally we open the doors at about 8.30 p.m. UK time. So next week there will be no talk, but join us in the pub at 8.30. That's it. Um, I have to thank a few people who were very helpful in the background. First of all, there's Cleo, who was my backup, and she was my purveyor of questions. So she selected them for me. And I also want to thank Malcolm and Igor, who were looking after the technical side of things. But of course, the biggest special thank of the evening goes to you, Ian Cable. And one more time, everybody in the chat, send your applause, send your thank yous. We really enjoyed ourselves. And all I have left to say is have a good evening. Have a good week and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Stay safe, stay healthy and stay skeptical. <laughs>